So this workshop is, ha, just to make sure everyone's in the right room, this t title of this workshop is Are We There Yet? Uh, integrating Artificial Intelligence and Triage. And I just want to say if we had a, a list of top trending topics at this, uh, at this conference, I think Artificial Intelligence would be up be among the top ones on that, on that trending list. But this, this workshop is going to focus on uh, one particular aspect of using artificial intelligence and that's how we can use that as a tool for helping our clients uh, locate uh, appropriate and available legal resources uh, for their legal issues. Um, each of our presenters uh, uh, represents a state which received a TIG uh, to integrate uh, artificial intelligence classifier into an existing uh, triage tool. So they're not starting from scratch. Um, so let me introduce our panel. Um, Gwen Daniels here from Illinois Legal Aid Online. She is part, her organization is partnering with uh, Legal Aid Chicago on a TIG project. Uh, Jack Haycock is from Pine Tree Legal Assistance in Maine. He is the, uh, Jack, you got a different title than I'm used to, <laughs> Client Focused Technology Innovator at Pine Tree Legal Assistance. And then on, at the end of our table here is Rochelle Hahn, who is the co-director of the Massachusetts Legal Aid Websites Project, and she's also collaborating with my program, Community Legal Aid, uh, uh, on a uh, TIG there. Uh, I'm the director of client access at Community Legal Aid, uh, where I focus a lot on, on technology initiatives. Um, so while each of us are sort of approaching this their, their, their TIGs in a different way, you're going to hear about that. We do share some common objectives. Um, and first among those is, um, is artificial, artificial intelligence a viable solution to that typical problem of, of users getting lost within our issue trees, um, which is the foundation of so many of these tools. Along with that, we're even asking ourselves, can the AI platforms be trained sufficiently to be of any real and practical improvement on these, on these triage tools. And along with that, we'll be hearing about the tools that we're using and are they ready uh, yet to be uh, integrated in our uh, systems. Um, uh, subsumed within that, we, you're going to hear a little bit about the objective of trying to create a single comprehensive platform to manage tools in, in states where there are a multiplicity of programs and resources available for our client community. And also a little bit about how client-centered learning, uh, what has that taught us in terms of how these tools can be, can be implemented. Um, let me just add, that also by way of introduction, as part of our, our, our TIGs, we were uh, required to collaborate and work together. So our, our three states here have been doing monthly meetings on, uh, around our projects uh, since we began uh, work in earnest in early 2019. So with that, I am going to uh, move us, oh, we lost our... Are we there yet? So I'm going to let our panel um, tell us uh, how we're doing in terms of progress. Jack, you're up first. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Gordon said, I am Jack Haycock. I work for Pine Tree Legal Assistance in Maine. And while I can't really, <laughs> let's just say Homer's got it right. We're uh, just a little further. Um, so what I'm really going to speak about today is the um, probably less exciting portion of an AI and triage integration project, which is fixing up the foundations of an existing triage tool. Um, so we wanted our users, um, we want them to have a choice um, about using this AI-powered tool or not. Um, and so when our triage does go live with AI, we're not taking away the option to go through the traditional logic tree. Um, and so that's one reason that for this project I thought it was very important to make sure that our logic tree and the underlying foundations of our triage tool are in really good shape and we have something good to build on to actually integrate the AI into. Um, so our triage tool has been, it's been around since 2015, it's one of the earlier ones. And we have a lot of data um, that we've collected over the years about how well it's working or not working. Um, and uh, so trying to incorporate an AI before we really took a look at those underlying issues would have been a little bit of an upstart. Um, 
So one thing that we knew about our triage tool is that people are getting lost. Um, from the, really the launch of the tool um, until the end of 2018, the third most common endpoint overall in our whole triage tool for those three years was I can't find my family law issue in this listing. And number four was I can't find my problem anywhere on your list. And that's troubling for a lot of reasons. Um, but what was especially troubling about it is the fact that people seem to be getting lost in places not because we didn't have what they were looking for, but because the way the system was set up, people were getting lost. Um, they were taking a wrong turn somewhere in that triage logic tree. And we knew we had some work to do on that. Um, and we needed to figure out exactly what that work would be. Um, and so this is kind of <laughs> one of my beautiful visuals of all the places people were not finding what they were looking for. Um, one of the biggest ones, probate, will, estates, we have information about that. Um, we have actually information about most of these topics in our triage tool, but still people were not able to find it. And so this is where the start of many of our wrong turns uh, <laughs> was. Um, this is our main topic selection screen from our triage tool. Um, and this is where we ask people to decide, top level, what kind of legal issue do you have? Pick a category. Um, and that's where most of the misunderstandings start. Um, so something that didn't help was that for a while, our top level categories in our triage tool and our top level client education categories on our website were mismatched. Um, they were different, they weren't identical. Um, in 2017, we did a significant redesign of the website and an overhaul of how we organized our content, but weren't able at that time to get our triage tool to match all that big work we did. Um, so we needed to figure out exactly how to approach this. So what did we do? User testing. It was as simple as that. <laughs> Um, so I've been lucky enough to get to come to ITCon uh, several times over the last few years. And one year, a few years ago, I learned an awful lot about user testing from Gwen Daniels and Angela Tripp. And so to get to this undertaking, um, I implemented probably the most useful thing I learned, which is if you offer people something nice, they really, really want to help you. Um, and so I, made up this sign um, and we handed out $15 grocery store gift cards um, for people's time. Um, and it worked out really well. Um, but I do have a confession to make. Um, I was very terrified of doing this user testing. I am an introvert. I am a team of one within Pine Tree. Um, and user testing didn't really seem like it would be a strong suit of mine uh, or even in my wheelhouse at all but I was actually really blown away by how simple it ended up being and how, um, how effective it was. Um, I had a small budget. I had some poster boards, some arts and crafts supplies, uh, some gumption and also some lamination paper because otherwise I would um, spill coffee on everything. And I'm not gonna get into the finer points of it, um, but I do want to hit some of the high points of our user testing. So we did in-person user testing at, um, at PTLA offices throughout the state. So I would drop into walk-in hours and set up with my sign and kindly ask people if they would like to take 15 more minutes to test with me. Um, I also did some testing at the Bangor Public Library, which was fantastic. Um, we offered $15 grocery store gift cards to participants for about 15 to 20 minutes of their time. Um, and the testing itself consisted of two exercises. So a card sort here with my very, very fancy um, professional card sort uh, interface. And we also did a triage observation test where we asked people to live on the site go through a, either a problem that they had themselves, came up with themselves from a, you know, a friend or a family member, or from a select list of common issues that people had going through triage. Um, I observed, took notes, and took extensive photo documentation of all of these card sorts. Um, and overall, we conducted 22 user tests in that initial round. Um, and so how did it go? Well, 
there were some key takeaways that I got really, really quickly. Early on in the testing, I was already seeing these patterns coming to light and they bore out through the rest of the testing. So the victim rights category was one that we had in our triage and on our main, um, our main topic library and that was something that the language we got directly from our domestic violence and sexual assault unit, that's what they wanted to call it, that was how they wanted to go about it. But in testing, it turns out that category is incredibly difficult for people to understand. Um, people tend to over include things in this category because, and I think quite rightly so, many of our clients feel victimized by many systems. Um, it's not just in a domestic violence context. Similarly, the going to court category gets used as a catch-all by users, um, often with the reasoning that, well, this is gonna end up in court eventually, so I guess I'm going to court. <laughs> Um, and users also consistently sorted public benefits topics into our health and public benefits category, but they also tended to, in, you know, in our original thinking, over include some topics under health, um, especially things that really did have health consequences. Um, the most common of those were issues to do with mold and housing and bed bugs. And so I think that's a really good example of, um, how rigid legal topic categories often fall down in trying to um, help people figure out, do you have a legal issue, what is that legal issue, and can you get help from legal aid with that issue? Um, and so some of the things that were getting sorted um, into, especially the victim rights category, were uh, divorce, criminal charges, discrimination at work, um, some other interesting things, and this was especially on the triage, op triage observation, people really didn't like the submit button at the end of the logic tree. Um, it was confusing, and I got more questions than I really expected to get about like submit where, submit to what, like submit to who, what, like what is this? Um, it really wasn't something that users were comfortable with. Um, also, explanations and examples are really helpful to our users. If the text is large enough and easy enough for them to read, something that you might have noticed on our original like logic tree selection, we had a lot of information under there about the kinds of things you'd find in each topic, but especially on smaller screens, even on bigger screens, they were so small that nobody could read them, and so that's not helpful for anyone. Um, Another thing was that a linear triage tool can be confusing um, when you don't explain that up front for what it is. Um, trying to explain how it addresses or doesn't address folks who have multiple even interconnected legal issues. The simplest example might be an eviction with a security deposit issue. Our triage would separate those things. You would have to choose the eviction branch or the security deposit branch. You can't do both. And while that's a limitation of our tool that we know about, it's not one that our users necessarily know about or understand or expect. Why would they? Um, another thing was that clear navigation options in the triage tool are important and people will use them. And here I'm really talking about like the go back button. Um, but people struggled with misclicks. Um, they struggled with finding a way back to the previous screen even when it looked like um, when it looked like the back button was pretty obvious. Um, but it was something that, okay, it's our design here is not working. Um, and the kind of the biggest takeaway from this was that users don't actually know what triage is, which I think probably to many of us who have worked on triage tools will not come as a surprise because we have struggled for a long time to figure out what do we call these things? How do we like brand these so the public know what they can do with this, what it can do for them. Um, so that wasn't too surprising. So what does this have to do with my AI project and why have I been talking about user testing this whole time and not really mentioning AI? So here are the ways that I think this user testing is not just important but really foundational to the project that we're gonna be able to do with our AI. So the insight into how our users think and talk about their legal problems, that's valuable training data. That's insight on how our users categorize their legal problems. Which parts of the interface are users relying on and drawn to? Which parts are confusing and frustrating? All right, what kind of UI, what kind of visual design should we have and use in our AI, AI tool? How can we make it really clear and easy for people to use it? 
And a better understanding of the strengths and the limitations of our triage tool as it exists today, well, that's knowledge of the system that we're gonna be integrating that AI with. Um, and we may be able to kind of play the strengths of the AI in the same places we have other weaknesses in our tool and identifying areas, um, especially in the categorization of common confusion. Where are people getting lost? Where can we use AI to help meet that? And so what are the next steps? We're just gonna keep swimming. Um, but <laughs> more seriously, we are, um, we're hoping to implement the spot classifier um, into our triage tool, which is something you will be hearing much more about very shortly. So we do want to hold some time for conversation at the end, uh, before we uh, conclude the workshop, but if you have a sort of a burning question you just want to ask Jack right now, we'll take a, a couple questions. Is this on? David. How, how is your gift game so strong? <laughs> <laughs> years and years of experience. David wants to know how my gift game is so strong and it's just, just experience. Have you used online user testing tools like usertesting.com and um, similar applications? So um, the audience member just asked, have I used online testing tools um, in this, uh, such as usertesting.com, you said? No, I haven't, um, but Gwen has. Uh, and so are you going to, would you like to? So we've used um, Optimal Workshop, which we've used to do card source, similar to what Jack has done. We've used Validately, which is a platform that a user tester has to then install a piece of software onto their mobile device or their desktop, and a video records their session, then we can watch the video and, and evaluate it. Um, lately, we've been using Usability Hub quite a lot, um, because I can do really quick and easy tests, and if I pay for their panels, which is pretty inexpensive, I can get um, testing results in a couple of hours. Why don't we move on, Gwen? So our online triage and intake system, or OTIS, as we call it in Illinois, um, was created in 2013 um, and initially started with as a platform for the three LSC-funded programs to get online um, intake through the statewide website. And it has since expanded to seven programs um, in the last six years. It was always designed, because we've got um, seven different programs all with different everything, it was always designed to be incredibly flexible and expandable. Um, and as a result, we have a, a pretty solid foundation, but we've got 168 different triage rules and intake settings um, living in our, in our system. And, we, and it averages about 800 to 900 successful e-transfers a month. Um, we have about 8,000 people who use it a month. Um, but it's got a lot of problems. Um, it, it's, It works pretty well for, for most users, but we did an evaluate, or the Lawyers Trust Fund did an evaluation um, with us and with our, our partners and an external consultant to look at the overall experience um, of the system. And they found some things that um, raised some issues. There's the user journeys for a user who comes in and uses it, it's, it's really complicated. Um, and I'll, I'll take you through a demo. It, it relies on our legal issues taxonomy, which is about 1,200 options. Um, so it's really hard to use. And then there's a lot of um, repetitive questions because we allow the programs to write their own triage rules that come after a, our triage rules. Um, and then we've got some issues now that, because it keeps expanding, where we have overlapping programs, particularly in Chicago, that take the same cases for different, with different criteria. Um, one program may take a bankruptcy case when there's a um, threat of foreclosure and somebody else in that same location may take a bankruptcy case when there's a, driver, a revoked driver's license. And so routing the user through all of that logic um, right now is not transparent and not 
um, easy. So I'm actually going to exit this real quick and show you exactly what I'm talking about. So this is um, me. Screen. Make this bigger. If I start typing, it gives me a drop down and I can pick from a list. I can actually also put in some text and hit enter, but I'm going to pick, a, I have a cut in my food stamp and I'm in Chicago and I'm looking for a lawyer. I have three people in my household. My, in, I'm, my income is less than $6,000 a month. None of these apply to me. And I'm going to accept the terms and conditions. And hopefully this works. Okay. And now I get into the program triage rules and I'm just now saying, a stream says, okay, what, is your, what should these apply to me? Were they reduced, terminated, denied, stopped, or none of these? But I just told you, they were cut. And then I get a follow-up question, well, is it because of something that you did? No. And then I can get into the full intake application. But I, I still have no clue, um, really no clue of who I'm applying to. And so we've got a lot of, of um, okay, how do I get out of full screen? A, a lot of user experience um, issues that we need to work through. this back in the present mode. So our, our approach is a little bit broader, I think, than, than the other um, AI TIG grants because we're doing more than just in, in, integrating the classifiers. We're actually doing a complete rewrite um, of our Otis platform to use dual classifiers. We're going to use both the Houston AI legal classifier and the CELFA lab cla um, classifier. But we're also using um, Legal Server's guided navigation platform to do, um, to move all of our triage logic. And then we're also using their um, Legal Server's legal issues library, which is sort of an, an AI um, tool to help surface um, legal issues. So instead of going through the mess that, that a user goes through now, um, they'll give us their story. They get, we figure out what the top legal category is. If we, don't, if we didn't get it right, the user then has to go through the taxonomy or a, a, a lighter version of it. Um, and then on the back end, we triage them across all the programs and then they apply to that one program and then they're done. So why are we looking at two different classifiers? Because we get, they give us, me different, right now they give me different results. Um, both of the classifiers are working really hard to train all of their data, but it's a time, it's, it's an intensive process. You need millions and millions of records in order to get really, really good data across the entire spectrum. So if I put in, my landlord wants to kick me out and the spot classifier, I get housing as the answer, which is right. And if I put it in Houston AI, I get private landlord tenant. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples that I, I ran through um, last week. Um, there's been a lot of work on some of these classifiers in the last, since this concert, co conference started, so the results may have changed. Um, but that will allow us to take the text of a, a, a text area on the form, say, tell us your story, and then the user can type in their story. We send it off to the classifiers, and they come back and say, this person probably has a private landlord tenant problem. So we can then follow up and ask them some additional questions to verify that it's correct. And then we can send that data, whether we're right or not, back to the classifiers and help improve those systems. Um, the guided navigation is a, is a feature within Legal Server and it's an expert system. They are working on building an API that will allow us to interact with it through our website so that we have total control over the user experience on our end. Um, but it, what it, that will do will let us take those 168 separate sets of triage rules and create one master library of triage rules for all of, our, all of the programs in Illinois. And then the programs will pick and choose what they take. Instead of Legal Aid Chicago writing 
their own public um, food stamp rules and Prairie State writing their own food stamp rules, they will have one library to pick from and we will have plain language and translated the rules for the, the, the triage rules for them and all they have to do is check some boxes on the back end that says, okay, well we'll take um, food stamp cases where the benefits have been reduced and it's been more than 14 days and when, or when it's been less than 14 days and the user may qualify for expedited food stamps. Um, so we'll, we'll ideally be making the user experience on the back end easier for the program admins but at the same time by asking one question, one or two questions to the user on the front end, um, I can go back and pass that data back to the guided navigation API and it comes back and spits out, Legal Aid Chicago is where this user needs to go. And then they don't have to worry about answering any questions. If they get kicked out of Legal Aid Chicago, okay, who's next? Um, we can pick the best program without the user having to see anything. So, you know, cross your fingers. Um, our next step is we are in the middle of this project now. We have, um, we have finished up the initial design work um, and we are in the middle of coding all of the back end. We expect this to go live sometime this spring. Um, and one more thing for the classifiers, there needs to be a way to use them. Um, I spent last weekend finishing up a Drupal 7 version of the spot classifier. The link's up on the, th on the slides. So you can um, download it, install it in a Drupal 7 instance, um, get a free API key, and start playing with the spot um, classifier in Drupal. And we will be working with our developers to create the Drupal 8 version and make that available to um, the universe. Um, two, two or three TIG conferences ago, I did the Houston AI version of the legal classifier Drupal 7 module. It is up on drupal.org and I don't have the link in here. It needs a little bit of work and we will be doing the Drupal 8 version of that as well. So any burning questions for Gwen before we move on to our final state? Spot produces more than one probable result. Are you going to give them a choice and let them say, it looks like you're talking about food stamps, but you might also be interested in this, this, and this, and then send that back to, to educated? Or you just, because you just mentioned giving one. I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, narrow it down to one very likely result, but we do have to confirm with the user that that is their problem. And give, we, if, if we get results that score high enough, then we should also ask them, is it one of these things? And then again, send that training data back um, and confirm with the user that their problem is actually this. Or they may also have, well, it's this, this, and this. And that's one of the, um, I think one of the advantages of using the classifier stuff is that we can identify multiple issues. If a user comes in and says, I'm being evicted out of my apartment because I lost my job, that's, that could be multiple legal issues that we need to uh, evaluate and triage for. Um, which we can't get right now with the taxonomy where you have to pick, I lost my job or I am being evicted. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm just curious, that list of issues that you had, was that something that came from the legal issues library and legal server? Or are you creating that? And is that something that you kind of have a menu for your programs to be able to choose from to say what other intake criteria? Um, the question is where did our taxonomy come from? It came from, um, my executive director wrote it. It was, we started with, when we started our, our website years and years and years ago, we started with the National Subject Matter Index, um, like every, most everybody else. What we found over time was that those labels didn't always, they're not necessarily end user friendly. Um, I, I was part of the originally authoring team of the National Subject Matter Index, so I can tell you it was written by lawyers. Um, and it looked like it was written by lawyers, and it was written by committee. Um, so we sat back and we rewrote, um, essentially rewrote the National Subject Matter Index into more consumer-friendly taxonomy terms, and that's the, the, what drives our online triage Taxonomy is the same thing that we use on the front end for users who are navigating through our content. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to Massachusetts. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Rochelle Hahn. I work at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. And as Gordon mentioned, one of the hats I wear there is the co-manager of the co-director of the Websites Project. And as part of that, I oversee our statewide uh, legal resource finder, which is our triage portal uh, tool in Massachusetts. So our legal resource finder was a product of an early TIG that from Community Legal Aid. I think it was the Mass Justice Project at the time. And um, we launched back in 2014. I think we were actually one of the first um, uh, statewide triage projects to launch. And we continued to get high, high usage, about 2,000 searches or so a month. And um, although when we built the original triage tool, we built it with somewhat of a legal services perspective, so the kinds of issues we were identifying were both issues that our legal services programs wanted to see and wanted to encourage intakes on, and we also included a lot of terms that we did not want to have intakes on so that we could direct people to appropriate resources elsewhere. In pretty short order, our, the scope of the programs in the resource finder really expanded greatly, and we now have over 80 different programs in the, in the tool, and it covers just the wide range of civil legal services in Massachusetts and civil legal aid. We have our core legal services programs. We have nonprofits that have legal programs. We have um, government agencies like the Attorney General's, which have legal um, components to some of their programs. Um, court programs, a lot of lawyer for the day programs, our court law libraries um, provide legal information and assistance to people. So all those different um, resources are included in our tool. And in addition to giving referrals to folks, we also um, give links to targeted legal information. Again, very curated targeted information, primarily to information on our statewide websites, but also trusted sources like um, court website and government websites. So, um, and similar to these other folks, the way you navigate our tool is through a triage uh, triage terms. You select a topic from the list, it opens up additional terms, we try to keep it to two or three levels, and when you're at the end of that list, you click a button, which I hope now doesn't say submit, um, and um, you are brought to your list of, of, of referral options. So, as with um, Maine and Illinois, you know, this launched back in the dark ages of triage, 2014. There's been a lot of changes since then and a lot of great work that's been done by a lot of the people here in this room and at this conference. And so um, we really wanted to, we wanted to bring all the new features that have been developed in other states back to Massachusetts. Also, it, you know, the interface was, you know, is now somewhat dated. And you know, the more you work with the tool, like the day after you launch, you realize, oh, why did I do it that way, or why did I do this? So the, you know, over time, we had developed we, a long laundry list of things that we wanted to change or, and enhance. And Community Legal Aid um, applied for another TIG and was thankfully awarded one to update and enhance the Legal Resource Finder. So. Um, there are a lot of things we're doing with this TIG in addition to adding the AI component. We're moving it to its own website. Right now it's on one of our existing statewide websites. It's going to be its own um, website now built in Drupal 8 with an Angular front end. And I think this is just going to add, this is because as it really truly has become more of a portal than just a legal aid tool, I think this is going to uh, give um, be helpful for it. Um, we want a cleaner, mobile-first interface for our users. Um, and in fact, when we did the testing, we tested pretty much strictly on mobile um, because that's how the, most of the client users are using the tool. We wanted a better interface for the providers. This is something that I think gets lost in a lot of triage tools. We have a very complex back end that the providers, all, the, all those 80 programs in the tool have to keep their information up to date. If they don't keep it up to date, then you, then what's the point of your triage tool? But it's a real pain to keep it up to date right now. And because our tool is so granular, we have over 600 terms. There's a lot of um, different elements you can choose. You know, it, it's not fun to keep it to keep it updated. So that's something we actually have put a lot of time and thought and testing and design work into testing for our program admins, not just our client users. Um, we also wanted a better display of the overall program listing in the tool. Um, we had a, a Justice for All 
process in Massachusetts, and we had an ecosystem work group, and one of the conclusions was that we have so much great work in Massachusetts, but not everybody knows all the resources that are out there. And so having an enhanced display of just the overall mapping of, of what's going on in Massachusetts is what we're also going to be doing through this tool. We're also adding in a Guide Me tool, which is our new uh, term for a legal checkup tool, um, which we're using DocAssemble to help program. And the thing we're here to talk about today, we're adding a natural language search to make it easier to navigate our taxonomy. We had facing the exact same issues that these folks have talked about. Um, it's not always obvious how to which which topic to choose from from our list, and so we're hoping that a natural language search will help that. And we are powering our natural language search in part by. Um, AI. You know, from the client's perspective, they don't care what we're powering it by. <laughs> they just want there to be good results, but we're hoping that by using um, an AI tool, it's going to give us um, better results. So we got the TIG, and um, we started our review and design and testing. We worked with a small company called Pixels for Humans, um, which is uh, has expertise in usability and user testing. And we did you know, an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the current site, including our own data. As with uh, Maine, we have a lot of data and information that we've gathered over the years. We reviewed other triage sites, reviewed all, a lot of studies that have come out and evaluations and other um, states to user testing. One of the really great things about this community is that we've been able to, you know, the, the user testing that um, Jack has done was directly relevant to the kind of work that we're doing. So um, that was very helpful. Um, we developed a, a design and a prototype was built in something called Envision, which is a very lightweight tool. And this was great because it meant we could test the tool with users and they were doing it on a phone um, instead of on paper but we hadn't programmed it yet. So when we got the results from testing, we could make changes right then and there before we actually turned it over to our programmer. So we did, of course, modify. When we tested it with users and with admins, we actually tested for the admins. We were testing on a laptop. With the users, we were testing on a phone and made modifications. And then we've turned the design over to our programmer, Scott Friday, and a number of you have worked with him. And um, he's currently in the middle of programming the site and we developing a prototype. And as I said, we're doing a Angular front end with a Drupal 8 back end. So we have added, um, this is a screenshot from the current, uh, I wouldn't say we're in alpha yet, but we're getting there, um, uh, from the current site. And so what we have done is we've added a simple text box um, at the very start of the process, um, asking people to, to you know, tell us briefly what their own, uh, what their problem is. At the moment you'll see the text box is pretty small. Um, we will see, we, we will probably be doing some experiments with that text box to, to, to see what size um, is optimal. For purposes of the, of the AI tool, it's better if you have um, more words. On the other hand, we don't want people to spend a lot of time putting words in, and certainly we don't want people writing a treatise about their problem. Um, so we're going to be experimenting with what size we use for the text box. Um, so we, and we are still, as you see, keeping our, our topic list. So we're not requiring people to put, do, a, do a description of their um, of their problem. Some people may not want to do that. Also, I'm going to be interested to see how on a phone, whether people are going to want to type or they may just choose to click when they're on a phone. So I think that's going to be interesting data there comparing how people behave on a desktop where you're sort of more set up to, to type than, than on a phone. Um, and um, also, it was interesting when we did some of the initial testing, we were testing with a topic for eviction. And most people just ignored the text box because to them it felt very easy to figure out, hey, housing is an eviction problem. I'm just going to go there. But some of the other topics like mold, that might be um, a more complex. Or I've been looking back over past website feedback and questions from our legal resource, uh, from our Mass Legal Answers project. And there's some unusual <laughs> subject issues that get, that get um, put in. And so some of those, I think, may be more really be helping to really move the dial for, for the users in finding their way in our taxonomy. 
So this is how it looks. So you put it, you put something into the box. In this case, someone said, I paid my rent, but my landlord keeps threatening me with legal action. That's actually based on a real in uh, email that I've gotten from somebody. So you know, some, some of our clients are using legal terms. And this returned a potential match. It says, it looks like you're looking for legal resources on housing. If that, if the user feels that that's a good match, they can click the button to do go, or else they can pick a topic from the list. And we did include, we have, we have in our current site, and we're keeping in our new site, those little subheadings. Um, it was something that in testing, the users really liked that and, and looked at those words. So it is something that we are gonna, we're gonna keep in. So what's behind the curtain? <laughs> um, how did we get to that result? So right now we're using two things. Uh, the Legal Innovation and Technology Lab Spot API, they're based at Suffolk, and David Colarusso is here, and I'll probably be turning over questions to him, and he's doing a presentation about Spot next, so if you're interested, you could stay on for that. And then we're also, as I'll talk about, we're also doing uh, some full text, old fashioned full text search within our legal resource finder. So what is Spot? We've referred to it a lot today. This is right from their website. Um, Spot's an, you know, an issue spotter. You give Spot a non-lawyer's description of a situation and it returns a list of likely issues from the National Subject Matter Index version two. So um, the NSMI uh, t list has parent terms, uh, like housing would be a parent term, and then it has child terms, so something like eviction might be a child term of, of uh, housing, and then, I don't know, you call them grandchildren or great-grandchildren, there's additional children <laughs> uh, below that. I mean, it, it's, it's an issue tree. Uh, right now, not all of the children are active um, in SPOT. The, I think most of the key top-level terms are active, and they're starting to roll out some of the ch ch child terms, and then you know, over time, additional child terms are being rolled out. Um, and so, yeah, so we anticipate that over time, uh, the child terms will be deeper. Um, and what we have done in our website, we've mapped all of our taxonomy terms to the relevant NSMI version two term. So that meant we didn't have to we didn't have to make our terms be the exact same thing as the NSMI terms. We have the complete flexibility to set up our terms the way we think it should be set up, and to phrase it the way we should think it should be set up, and to make them as granular or as broad as we think appropriate. But in the back end, we have a map. So when Spot returns housing, we know what housing is equal to in our own terms. And in our site, what people are being presented with is the way we phrase that term, not the way um, an SMI version two has presented the term. So why Spot? Um, so we do right from the start that building and maintaining our own classifier wasn't gonna be sustainable. Um, you know, even if we had used some money to, to create the technology over time, we certainly couldn't do that. And the massive amount of training that's involved in getting these classifiers to work properly was just something we knew we, were, we weren't gonna be able to do. So we were very fortunate that at the time we were doing this project, Spot was being rolled out. And um, so we've selected Spot API as the initial classifier for us to use. Um, there were a lot of reasons for that. It's run by a nonprofit for the nonprofit community, so our values are aligned. And they're committed to not selling the data, but any data that gets shared is being used to improve the tool for the benefit of the client community and the legal services community and the nonprofit community. So that was important. Um, we got the sense that it had traction from other entities, like folks here they are gonna use Spot, and I think the LSC portal projects are using Spot. So the more people in our community that are using it, the better it's gonna be, both from a training perspective and also just as we develop new, new ways to use Spot. Um, the SPOT team, thankfully, is responsible for training. <laughs> you know, they're overseeing that. You know, things like what they're doing today, getting, you know, thousands of new, um, new training into the tool is, is great. And um, so we're benefiting from the community and giving back to the community. And also, it's free. <laughs> and despite the image, it's actually not free like puppies. It really is free. <laughs> so, um, so that is, of course, always um, nice. So Spot is still being trained, and so 
sometimes the results are not quite what you would expect. Um, so we have added internal full text search to complement the classifier. And this full text search is, uh, we are actually going to be adding metadata to our own terms. Like we've already added, the, for example, the word apartment to our housing terms. And that actually has, rapid, has really increased uh, the, the accuracy of the results. So what you see on, in this image, that was the term that, that someone had typed in. In the back end, this is showing that Spot API said it was housing and Search API said it was housing. That's not something that the client is, the user is ever going to see, where you have that in there for our own testing purposes. And um, this full text search is actually based on something that our programmer had done with Connecticut Legal Aid. They have some full text search in their site now. So what the algorithm that we have going on in the site is it's weighting the results based on um, what's happening with Spot and what's happening with the full text search. And so, for example, if both Spot and our full text search are saying it's housing, that's you know, more likely that it's going to be returned as a, for, to the user. If there's a disagreement, then you know, that's going to uh, be a, a factor. Um, with Spot, you can set your, reli your, re your reliability rating, or what's the, what's the word, great word? Threshold, right. So, I, you know, if it's a 25%, uh, if Spot thinks, they're t thinks it's 25% likely that it's accurate, we're probably not going to show that to, to a user. So we can tinker with the, how accurate we want the thresholds to be, and, and this is something that we're still working on. So right now we have these two in our, in our um, site. Our programmer is actually experimenting with Watson as well as another um, classifier to be at to help um, influence the results um, so that that still is being worked on so here's just another couple of examples the stuff in the box is stuff that wouldn't be shown to a user so I lost my job and can't pay my rent in this case there actually are two issues that could that could be there I mean someone might be wanting some help with unemployment they might be wanting help with housing so both of those results are are showing there the other one, I want to visit my grandchild, but her mother won't let me. Um, so family is what I, is where it would be found in our tool. Wills and estates is actually not a good result in our particular tool. So I'm just saying that this is still a work in progress and we still have to tweak these algorithms and figure out how to make, sh how, to get, how to get the most accurate results. Um, so next steps, you know, as I said, we're, we're working on the, on the algorithm. What's nice is that we, it's, it's very, what was really helpful is that we'll, we'll be able to launch this legal resource finder even if all the <laughs> natural language search falls apart, which I don't think is going to happen. But we can, we don't need, we, we are still, we're going to be in a position to launch even if the, if the tools aren't as ready as we want them to be. Because um, we want to launch sometime early fall. Um, but um, we have the ability to tweak the algorithm to have to tell them how reliable the results have to be, and over time, the results are going to get more and more reliable. Um, we are continuing to help train Spot. Um, we by providing sample questions. You know, for example, right now there aren't a lot of eviction questions in Spot, but that is a huge issue area for the Legal Research Finder. That and divorce are the top ones. So we will be providing a bunch of sample eviction questions to be added to the, to the classifier so we can um, you know, it'll improve the results there. And testing, we're gonna be doing testing with users before we, before we launch, making sure that they're able to use these res the, the tool and that they find the results helpful. So, questions? Okay, let's open this up for conversation and questions. Let's see, hands right up front here. Hi, great presentation. Thank you so much for all of it. I have a very specific question. What happens when you click Go, the blue Go, on any one of those uh, search results? I'm just curious what that next page looks like. Yeah, so that's good. that brings you into the triage. It'll give you uh, the next set of questions that get asked. So right now, um, it will ask you something like, you know, are you looking for help on a divorce? I, I, whatever our next set of questions are in our issue tree, yep. that's what it will bring you to. And over time, right now that's a top level category, but over time, hopefully, for example, if someone's asking about divorce, it will bring you to the child term of divorce. It'll, and so it would say, I, it looks like you're looking for information on divorce, and if they click on it, go, it will bring you right to the divorce. So it will bring you deeper into the triage tool. 
Thank you. And, and what ultimately is the end result? So at the very end, when you get through the, the end of the triage, then actually we ask a few demographic questions. Well, we do screen for income and geography. And then when you click the final button, it, pre it presents uh, a list of potential referrals, legal help referrals, and links to legal information. Cool. Thank you. I guess my, my quest was kind of similar, actually. I was just wondering if you envision a time where you can skip this kind of preview, like here are the problems that we think you have. Do you think you'll be able to get that level of confidence to give them one less screen to click through? Um, well, we'll see how quickly things develop. I, 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 my suspicion is that we will likely be able to bring people deeper into the triage. I don't anticipate that we will just give them their results right away. I think we're always going to have to give people the opportunity to sort of say, wait, this, is this what I mean, or, or pick an alternate path. Uh, Rochelle, have you ever, I'm sure you have contemplated the possibility of having the endpoint be a single uh, resource provider rather than a list? Um, that's not the direction that we're going in at this time because I mean, one of the fortunate things about Massachusetts is we do have a lot of different resources. Um, so. And different resources do different things. For example, an eviction problem, you, you might be able to get full representation from a program, but you also might not have time for that, and so you might need to go into the court and do a lawyer for the day program, or you might need to be linked to what Quinton has built, which is a, uh, a doc assemble way of answering your, um, your eviction complaint. So I don't think we're contemplating that at this time. I can add to that, because in we have a very vibrant lawyer for the day across a lot of our courts. So if you're, you're using this tool the day before your eviction hearing, it's unlikely you're going to be able to get legal aid to do anything for you. So it's going to tell you that when you show up for court, if you're, if you're in this particular location, that court has a lawyer for the day program that will tell you how to access that as well. So you can, you can get help there. We don't have intake on our triage tool. We don't have, which I know some of the triage tools do. We just, we give referrals. We, our state hasn't gone in that direction. Um, how important are um, multilingual support for the triage tools? I'm sorry, uh, did you hear you, what was that? How important is being able to cover Spanish and other languages for the triage, as well as the classifications, the natural language processing? So right now the site currently is in English and Spanish, and that's a good question. I mean, I, uh, if you put in your question in Spanish, then um, that I don't think the, the the spot classifier is going to work. Um, it could work for our in uh, for our, our um, Drupal search. I mean, our, our search within the site that will give you some results. But even if the spot doesn't return a result for this other language, they'll still be able to use the regular triage tool. Thank you for letting me ask another question. Uh, that list at the end of the triage of the uh, uh, legal service providers, I'm just curious, what is the conversation like internally amongst yourselves about what goes on that list, what doesn't go on that list? Is it an open conversation, internal conversation? Um, so right now, we're, our criteria are that people have to be nonprofits. Uh, entities have to be nonprofits to be in the list. We don't have individual attorneys, and we don't have any for profits in there at this time. But we are trying to be comprehensive. Although the other thing is that people have to be willing to keep their tool up to date. Hi, um, I am from Nebraska, and it's like large geographic area, small population. So I'm wondering how in a context where we're a statewide organization, I guess because I don't have the context or the experience with the AI, and you each talked about how you have to have so many, you're testing your AI and how that works. Is it within your own state that you're doing that? Because I'd be worried that it would take years and years right. and years to do that. So that's the benefit of going with SPOT. So SPOT is testing on a national level, and so we're benefiting from everybody. everybody's testing. Now, 
you know, there is going to be some discrepancy in terminology uh, across uh, across uh, across the country. So some people, but I think that discrepancy is actually probably more in the legal words. I mean, a lot of people are probably still saying divorce. They're not saying I want a dissolution of marriage. Um, I don't know. Maybe they are. I'm sure. <laughs> but but a lot of a lot of the words that people use are actually more similar than different. Um, it's the legal stuff that is going to be different. Yeah, and I can speak to that a little bit because Maine is also geographically a very large state with a very small population. Um, and so I was definitely on a little bit of a wild scientist kick for a while where I was like, okay, you know what? We just, we need to do our own thing because I, I don't trust the national training. I, like there's no way this is all gonna match up. But luckily um, through the wonderful collaboration with my cohorts here, they dissuaded me from that idea. Um, and the reason that they were so persuasive is exactly what Rochelle has mentioned, is that spot is um, actually kind of perfect for a state like ours where we only have, um, there are only about three million people in Maine and that might not even, we might not even be able to get significant enough results to train anything <laughs> from the access to the data that we would have just from within our own state. Um, and so SPOT made a lot of sense. Anyone else? We have to I don't know, David, I don't want to put you in the spot. Do you want to say anything more about SPOT here or do you want to just save it for the... So what, one thing in relation to your question, um, if part of that was uh, concern about uh, different legal issues per jurisdiction, um, then the answer there is that the, and this is a little, this is an unfortunate consequence of uh, terms of art, uh, the issues and the, the NISMI issues are, are more equivalent to what we might think of as fact patterns as opposed to issues. So a lot of times when lawyers think of issues, they think of legal remedies. And so there might be differing jurisdictions where there's a housing issue that has a remedy in one jurisdiction but not the other. So what SPOT's returning is saying, here's sort of the shape of the problem. You then map that to your own legal issues that are appropriate for your jurisdiction. So it's an issue spotter, but it's really more of like a fact pattern spotter. Um, yeah, so it's it's like this is a housing issue, and uh, you know, and the landlord's being crappy to me, right? You know, so maybe you have uh, nice tenant laws that's going to make uh, some remedy there, but maybe you don't. But Spot's just going to find out that that's the issue, and then you have to figure out what to do with that. So. Yeah. So I mean, all it's doing is it's just basically saying these are the the NISMI codes. And so to the extent that those map to something you can do something with, um, that's all it's doing. So it, it, it's not thinking about legal remedies, which is why it's not practicing law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just put in a plug. If you want to learn more about machine learning um, and SPOT, um, you don't even need to leave the room. I think the next David session it follows in this room uh, at uh, whatever the next one, 10, 1030. Could I just ask whether any of your programs have thought of adding uh, an element which you'd find on the equivalent English program, it's different, Citizens Advice uh, uh, website has this thing called an issue tracker, which allows you as a member of the public, you could do it from here, to see what questions are coming up at any time and gives you the statistics on the questions for the day. It may even give you the statistics so far this month. And so just in real time, it, it's really interesting as a political tool because if there's a problem with Social Security Administration in Darlington, then all these queries are coming in from Darlington, you can see that. If there is a big issue about uh, whatever it is, uh, flooding uh, in, the, in the north, uh, that comes up. And so it's a way of um, integrating the provision of individual advice and it would be particularly good if you've done all this work on identifying the categories uh, with a potential political use, plus it's, it's political at a small p because it allows individual people to see what work you're doing and how many cases are being processed. And I just wondered whether you're all looking a little blank, so I'm kind of guessing, <laughs> I'm kind of guessing for once the Brits are ahead on this one, but, the, but that may not be the case. I'm 
so we don't have anything that is sort of front facing that allows you know users to see here's all the questions that are being asked. Um, but we do capture and maintain an, on the back end a lot of data of people who are using our Get Legal Help um, platform. And we have been working with the Lawyers Trust Fund um, and with an outside consultant who is building us um, some scripts that will generate dashboards that will allow all of our program partners to see everything that's coming in and what's happening with all of the cases and different legal issues and different zip codes. Um, you know, who's who's dropping off where, who's actually getting served by the program, and who's getting you know call, no, no contact rates and, and all this other um, data so that we can see. But I'm, I do kind of like the idea of being able to let users see some of the, the stuff that's being asked once we get to the point where we're doing um, actual, don't, um, actual text input versus pick it off the list. Yeah, and we're, we're in a similar similar situation in Maine where we, we do keep really extensive information about those things behind the scenes, um, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, I think it is a really interesting idea. I think one of the challenges is um, we're just really careful about every single question that we add because it's so distracting to people. We want, and so um, even when we ask questions, we only want to ask questions that actually meaningful, are, are, are going to have a meaningful impact on the results that they get. We don't ask questions that are just interesting to us or, or um, things we might want to know. So I, I think that is a really uh, interesting um, project. I think it would partly be how, how we could a design issue almost is how we can do it without distracting from the main, uh, letting people accomplish their main goal. Hi, um, really good presentation, enjoyed it, thank you. Um, I'm wondering how, as you, as you begin to sort of get comfortable with the use of the kind of machine learning and AI to help you with this entry experience for the users of the website and your guide me's. Have you begun to think about like, okay, what, what's next? Are there other parts of the process of the service that we're delivering or how we assess the effectiveness of the referrals that we're making that you're beginning to think about how machine learning and AI could become a part of the, your, your work processes for those areas and what are the kind of questions and concerns that you think you'd have, need to have answered before you begin experimenting in those places? I mean, stand up I can't see. I mean, for, you know, for us, it's not even really an AI question of how effective is these systems in any capacity, even with the drop down, and that's why we've been doing all of this evaluation work. Um, both of the online experience for online triage and intake, but also what happens next. Um, the Lawyers Trust Fund in 2018 commissioned a pretty extensive study where they went in and looked at, okay, we have, you know, and I'm gonna make up some numbers because I don't have them on the top of my head. You know, we had 100,000 people complete, go through our Get Legal Help tool, and 2,000 of them actually got served by the program in, in a time period. What happened to the other 98,000? Um, and, and so we've done that analysis and we're continuing to do that analysis. And that's not really an, an AI issue, that's a whole process I, um, issue. And can, but we should be measuring, and it's important to think about this stuff when you're starting these projects is, um, what, is going, what might change when, if we can diagnose the user's issues better with the AI tools. Um, but you, we, it's really important to think about what you want to evaluate on and track on. Um, as early on because it's impossible to go back and say, oh, I didn't actually collect any of that data, so we don't have it for that period. And we ran into some of those issues. Um, I didn't track something in the first six months of the project um, when we went live with the Get Legal Help system that we actually wanted to have that data. We have it now going forward, but we didn't have it when we were looking at the two years, the first two years worth of data. So one thing, and I'm gonna get up a little bit on my soapbox here, um, because you asked about like where where else we could integrate AI into our processes, into serving our clients. And one thing that I've so, in addition to all the user testing that I did in the past year, I also spent a lot of my time working on this project, doing 
a lot of research, um, and especially a lot of research into um, another part of the project is about chatbots, and that's something separate that I'm not really talking about today, but what really came up there for me was making sure um, making sure there are data and privacy protections in place on, on the one hand with the AI, and that's one reason um, that our tool is very intentionally only going to, we're not gonna force anyone to use um, the AI option if they don't want to. Um, the, the logic tree will still be there. And for me, that really ties into also, um, I think really transparency around how we are using AI um, I think I think it actually does um, matter to our clients, like where where that information is going, who's going to see it, um, how it's going to be used, and I think having having transparency up front about that is important. And I'll go even a little further to say that I don't think um, I don't think we will ever, at least not um, in the in the future that I conceive of at my legal aid organization. I don't think we'll ever implement any kind of AI decision making where there is an AI making decisions about who, who will get what kind of service um, or even necessarily, um, you know, other, even, even other smaller things in our, in our processes. I think it's important to be um, really mindful of algorithmic bias and, and those issues were still very much in the early days, which is why this is an AI project that I'm really comfortable with because we're um, basically just trying to give people options um, and, leaving, and still leaving open the option to not engage with the system that's going to um, collect that kind of narrative data about you. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. Questions, comments? Conversation. Anyone has AI project they're working on that they wanted to share or talk about? Is anyone else working on uh, similar projects? And I saw you back there. <laughs> well, I think most people know that uh, LSE has been working with Pew and Microsoft and Pro Bono Net and. Uh, to do Legal Navigator and getting ready with Alaska and Hawaii to do a pilot project. And all, we're also using Spot with this. And uh, so, you know, that's something that we're, we're very excited about. We're doing the same thing, is that we're only doing it for the issue spotting, you know, to help the people identify what their legal issue is. And I think it's very important that people can come in, even if they don't know they have a legal problem, and be able to put in what it is. Now, we're going a little further as far as rather than just doing referrals at the uh, after they do the questions they'll get a personal action plan which they can actually save onto the platform and as they go through each step of that plan they can check off what they've done and accomplished it will move to the bottom but it will stay there and they can also share these action plans with other entities if they want to. Uh, for example, I think this is a good opportunity for us with pro bono attorneys to sign up and say that, you know, I'll be willing to review people's action plans, see what steps are missing, and then have a virtual conference with them about how to complete that step if they have an issue or something like that. So, uh, but there's, you know, this is a really exciting time for everybody to see how these are gonna shake out. Anyone else want to add anything? So we've reached the end. We've yeah. exhausted, have we really exhausted this topic? Yeah. <laughs>